on a paper I wrote for an academic class I'm taking as part of my master's program at Harvard Extension School in Medieval Studies. Uh, this class was called Religion in America. So what I tried to do was combine my scholastic interests with my main interest, which is esotericism. So the first thing is I'm approaching this topic from an academic history standpoint, but it's informed by uh, knowledge and experience in esotericism to some greater or lesser extent, depending upon what you might see it as. Um, I also want to say right up front, um, I'm not trying to convince you of anything one way or another. I'm simply going to present my argument and the evidence, and it's obviously up to every person to make up their own mind, which is the way I believe that it should be. I also want to say right up front that I do not mean to try to reinterpret Rosicrucianism or the Rosicrucian movement or movements in any way that may be uh, antagonistic towards anyone. Um, I am not trying to tell anyone that what they believe may be wrong or that tr a tradition that they might be associated with is not authentic or anything of the sort. Um, I'm strictly going off of documented evidence that I've been able to find in books and the internet and that anyone can find. Um, there's nothing that I'm going to talk about that is really hidden or mysterious here. But the topic itself deals, of course, with the esoteric and the mysterious, so it's a bit of a juggling act. Um, I also want to say uh, that this topic seems to have provoked uh, some strong reaction from some people. And um, again, I'm hoping that uh, everyone will listen to what I have to say without being too judgmental right away and, and reserve your judgment until it's over. Um, you may very well disagree with my conclusions, and that's okay with me. I'm not claiming I'm right. This is just the way I see things. Okay, so right up front, um, before we get into Rosicrucianism itself, the thesis that I'm working with here is that there were some German settlers in colonial Pennsylvania, namely Johannes Kelpius and the gentleman who is seen as his successor, Johann Conrad Beisel, they established religious semi-monastic communities in colonial Pennsylvania, and they had a number of esoteric philosophies and practices that were part of their communities. And what I am trying to point out is that their beliefs and practices share a remarkable number of similarities with what are commonly accepted hallmarks or landmarks of what we think of as Rosicrucianism. Now this is a difficult thing to do because first of all when we talk about Rosicrucianism the philosophy is based on three documents published in Germany um, the beginning of the 17th century, I believe, uh, known as the Fama, the Confessio, and the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz. So this is the fame of the fraternity, the confession of the fraternity, and the Chemical Wedding, which is a mystical allegory of the union of opposites, essentially with alchemical symbolism. So what I've tried to do is identify from these documents and from the movement or movements that these documents inspired. Because we have to recognize that the original Rosicrucian movement was talking about a mythological group 
a, a mythological fraternity that was not real in a physical sense. However, it inspired people to such a great degree that they wanted it to be real, that it should be real, and that they would attempt to make it real. So from the myth, we, which I would term the original Rosicrucian movement, which called for a reformation of society, not through the church and not through the established political system, but through a spiritual regeneration of each person individually through their own inner process um, that would eventually reform society. Um, Europe at that time was in turmoil, especially Germany. Um, Protestantism was relatively new. The Catholic Church was obviously not happy about it. Um, politically, socially, economically, there was a great deal of tension. And these manifestos appeared published anonymously. Uh, we know today, based on the work of scholars, that the likely authors were a man named Johann Valentin Andre, who was a Lutheran priest, and his mentor, uh, Dr. Tobias Hess. Um, they published them anonymously because to do so out in the open would have meant extreme persecution, perhaps worse. However, it was not long before the, these documents were spread far and wide. Um, they were overtly Protestant in outward appearance. If you read them literally, they were talking about uh, Protestantism, Lutheranism to be specific. However, uh, there's a number of ways to interpret them, just like any sort of esoteric document or text, um, particularly by applying the tradition of Kabbalism, um, gematria, and the use of language to see different layers of meaning within them. And it wasn't long before you had learned men all over Europe who were writing to this mythological fraternity asking to join um, when they didn't get any answer and they couldn't find any real Rosicrucians. Uh, eventually somebody decided, well, we're just going to make it happen ourselves, which that, that's fine. Um, and that's not to say that's not legitimate because they tried to embody the ideals that these manifestos put forth. So, one of the things I tried to look at was what are some of the hallmarks or landmarks of these documents? What are some of the hallmarks and landmarks of these Rosicrucian inspired real fraternities that formed in Germany and spread elsewhere? So, you have the idea of organization and secrecy. So, that would be one landmark of these groups. Um, reformation of society would be another landmark. Utopianism also happens to be a hallmark of them. In fact, um, the suspected author, Johann Valentin Andre, uh, not only wrote these manifestos, but he also wrote a more utopian uh, story called Christianopolis. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but uh, so I take utopianism to be a hallmark of these groups and their philosophy. Um, another is that the members of the fraternity did not publicly profess that they were members of the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross or that they were Rosicrucians. They would never say that they were. In addition, uh, they did not profess a belief in any specific form of Christianity. Although the documents were Protestant, um, 
they seem to have a what I would call a theosophical bent, a theosophical with the small t. Um, they embraced spirituality, the inner spirituality <laughs> that was that, that can be found in, in most every religion if you look for it, I think, and they, I think, um, they were agreeable really to any denomination of Christianity, and I think that's one of the ways you could interpret the fact that they didn't want to see the reformation of society occur through the church or a church. Now, it's also, as I said, possible to sort of delineate between this original Rosicrucian movement and later Rosicrucian-inspired movements. Um, so really determining a membership, if you will, in any group that could be called Rosicrucian is pretty much impossible before the 19th century. And that's okay because Again, my purpose is not to say that these settlers in colonial Pennsylvania were or weren't Rosicrucians. What I'm trying to say is that if we look at their beliefs and practices, they seem to share a remarkable number of similarities with what we think of as Rosicrucian beliefs and practices. Now, I know this is controversial because many people feel an attachment because they may be a member of a fraternity that considers itself Rosicrucian or is considered by the Western tradition to be Rosicrucian. And again, that's fine. I'm not trying to say that's good or bad or, or anything of the sort. Um, but I do think it's interesting that they feel a very strong sense of ownership and connection to the tradition to the point that um, I think the subject oftentimes brings out a lot of uh, animus, which I'm not personally too happy about, but that's beside the point. Um, okay, so these settlers, I think, could be referred to outwardly as Lutheran pietists. They were concerned with inward spirituality. Um, they could also be referred to as theosophists, again, with a small t. I, those are both probably far more accurate descriptions than calling them Rosicrucians. They're indisputable. Uh, everyone accepts these labels, and they probably would have accepted calling themselves pietists or theosophists certainly far more comfortable than the Rosicrucian label, which again, they themselves never used, just like in the manifestos, a real Rosicrucian would never self-identify as such. So when we look at some of these other hallmarks, um, I think Kabbalism, is another one I mentioned before. That's a crucial method for trying to see below the surface to interpret the meanings of these documents. The use of gematria. Um, I'll get into a couple examples of that. Um, alchemical symbolism, very important. Um, the use of alchemical symbolism in these documents, specifically the Christian, uh, the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, is entirely alchemical symbolism and Gnostic theosophy is really a crucial component. Again, by Gnostic theosophy I'm really referring to not necessarily the ancient Gnostics but this idea of an inner knowing or inner mystical experience of something they identified as divinity, if you will. So, you have the Kabbalah, you have Gnostic Theosophy, and you have alchemical symbolism. These things are intimately interwoven into what I would call the Rosicrucian movement, and even later 
Rosicrucian inspired movements. Now, um, when we get into the alchemical symbolism, um, one of the ways we see that outside of the, of the chemical wedding document is in these manifestos. They refer specifically to Paracelsus as having been a forerunner, uh, someone that they drew knowledge from. Now, Paracelsus, uh, I think, is widely accepted as an alchemist, as a theosophist, um, and someone who was seeking to reform society through his alchemical hermetic work. So he pursued an aim that was basically Rosicrucian prior to the advent of these manifestos. Um, Rosicrucian sympathizers, or those who were inspired by the manifestos, were often practicing alchemists. A great example of this is Thomas Vaughan, who's uh, Welsh, and he was practicing alchemist. I think he actually perished in an alchemical accident, and he was the one who first translated these manifestos into English from German, I believe, or was it Latin? I think it was, but another um, hallmark, I think, of Rosicrucianism is pilgrimage, travel to foreign lands, whether it is to learn or to teach or to spread the good word. Um, so I think we could probably say that pilgrimage or travel is a hallmark of Rosicrucianism. In fact, in the manifestos, they talk about uh, adopt the dress of the country you dwell in, adopt the manner of the people you dwell amongst, don't stand out, be one of the people, um, be one of them. Another is healing. And I think that's intimately connected with the alchemical tradition, um, making of alchemical medicines, which, and ultimately probably some sort of elixir of life, if you will. And they professed to heal the sick for free, to not charge anything for their healing work. So that would be, I think, another strong indicator of what we might think of as Rosicrucianism. <laughs> And again, uh, I want to stress uh, the idea that Rosicrucianism or Rosicrucian-inspired movements can accept and embrace different Christian denominations and even different religious faiths and see the value in them. You know, they were, these were not fundamentalists by any stretch. In fact, um, Frances Yates wrote in her famous book, The Rosicrucian Enlightenment, one of the most important aspects of the Rosicrucian movement is that it could include different religious denominations. Very important. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about Gematria and Kabbalism. Uh, I don't know how familiar you may be with this idea, but um, ancient languages, specifically I'm talking now about Hebrew and Greek, um, they use letters as both letters and numbers. So words could have numerical values if you added up the letters that made up the word. So when you apply this practice to the Rosicrucian manifestos, you get some pretty interesting results, I think. Um, they talk about the seal, mark, and character of the fraternity is R.C. Now, people could interpret that as Rose Qua, Rose Cross, um, but in Hebrew, the corresponding letters, when added together, give you a numerical value that uh, 
well, not even a numerical value. It gives you a Hebrew word that means tenderness or compassion, literally, rope. If you use the Greek gematria, the rose cross, and I don't mean just RC, but the rose cross itself, could be interpreted as church of the gnosis. And this was publicly disclosed by Paul Foster Case in his book, The True and Invisible Rosicrucian Order. Um, not necessarily accepted as an academic source. He's obviously an esotericist. Uh, he came out of the, a Golden Dawn lineage and formed the builders of the Aditum. He was steeped in Kabbalah, study of tarot, and he advanced the idea of Rosicrucianism, and I think rightly so, as an invisible fraternity. It wasn't real. Uh, it was an inward process. Uh, people might recognize one another if they were both uh, Gnostic theosophists, if you will. <laughs> that they would have these similar type of beliefs. Uh, the idea of the inward spiritual process that um, there's no outward marking, no uniform, no lapel pin or special ring that's going to identify you as a member of this fraternity because it's not real in the outward sense. It doesn't exist in the real world, it exists in our hearts. And that was what he tried to put forth in his book. And I think that's generally accepted among esotericists, um, generally. But it becomes a problem because you have groups like um, Amork, which publicly identifies itself as the ancient mystic order of the Rose Cross. You have Masonic Rosicrucian groups. You have... Uh, Society Rosicruciana in Anglia, which then spread around the world. That's the Masonic group. You also have the Rose Qua degree in the Scottish Rite, which is considered Rosicrucian, but they would just say Rose Qua. They would never say Rosicrucian. Um, but it included all the same symbolism, the rose and the cross, the pelican feeding its young from its own breast, um, the idea that Enlightenment comes from within, through one's heart, listening to the heart, going within, stilling the mind. Now, this Gnostic theosophy is interesting because it can really be linked very strongly with a German mystic named Jakob Barme. My pronunciation may be a little off, but okay. I think you may know you may know this gentleman's work. Um, he's a German mystic. He published his first book called Aurora in 1612, immediately before the Rosicrucian manifestos appeared in public. Um, Arthur Vers Lewis, who is a scholar of some note, he wrote this book, Wisdom, Ch Wisdom's Children, a Christian Esoteric Tradition. Um, and he talks about Jakob Burme and theosophy. And he says, Burmian theosophy was closely allied with Rosicrucianism in Germany during the 17th and 18th centuries, and that it is often difficult or even impossible to separate them. Essentially, both movements have as their basis a very similar hermetic science and indeed share so much symbolism and terminology as to be at times identical. I think this is crucial because to me this says these labels that we're dealing with are very nebulous. The ideas and philosophies behind them are far more important, and we can link them together based on that underlying philosophy. The symbolism that they employ and the practices that stem from those. Now, 
this Christian theosophy of Jakob Berme, uh, Gnosticism, and Hermeticism also have a number of further intersection points with Rosicrucianism, if you will. And those are the idea of the fall of man and a return to paradise, and eschatology or the study of the end times. Now that that's found elsewhere, but there's some more that we can find. Uh, the use of astrology and astrological correspondences. The use of symbolic language and imagery. The practice of meditation towards the goal of sublimation. And sacred music, which is a very interesting one, um, is a good example of that prior to uh, the colonial Pennsylvania settlers was uh, Michael Meyer, who's very strongly identified with the Rosicrucian movement. He actually wrote the, I don't know the, the exact title, but it's basically the rules of the fraternity. And I think he is one of the people who was so inspired by these manifestos that he wanted to form his own fraternity or a fraternity that embodied them. He published a book, Atalanta Fugians, filled with alchemical imagery and accompanied by music, which uh, you can find online, Atalanta Fugians, and the music to it is Baroque, I think it'd be the best uh, description for it. So if we combine these elements, we can see a number of trademark attributes of what we'll call Rosicrucian movements that we can compare with these esoteric groups in Pennsylvania. And that's really the basis for my research and trying to do this comparison. Um, now, the historical analysis available is, is not as great as it should be, but it's gotten a lot better. So, just to give you a little background, um, Johannes Kelpius was, I think, what we could consider a child prodigy in the field of theology. He graduated with a doctorate uh, from university in Germany and published his dissertation at age 17. He then published two further books, I believe, on Aristotelian ethics and theology uh, the following year. He was well-versed in astrology, Kabbalism, and other esoteric disciplines. He was intimately connected with a gentleman named Professor or Dr. Fabricius, who is also connected to the Rosicrucian movement, as well as a gentleman named uh, Christian Noor von Rosenroth, who published a book called Kabbalah Denudata, or the Kabbalah Unveiled, which was translated and subsequently published by Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers, uh, the founder, one of the founders of the Golden Dawn. And this was really the, of like a foundational document for a Christianized Kabbalah. Christianized in the sense that it used the techniques of Kabbalism, specifically gematria and symbolism, to essentially show that Christ and Christianity was really just an extension of Judaism and which from which the Kabbalah seem to seems to have sprung. So he's intimately connected with Rosenroth and probably learned the Kabbalah directly from Rosenroth. Kelpius was active in a number of what I'll call theosophic circles in Germany. Now again, at this, this is uh, the late 1600s. It's been decades since the original Rosicrucian Fuhrer, and in between that time was the Thirty Years' War. 
Uh, Europe was ravaged. Uh, now, I don't think you can.